I got a delay here on my, my movement. Here we go. Our mission and vision, uh, as you see here, is for every citizen and household in the Kansas City metropolitan area uh, has access to the internet, the equipment needed to use it, and the skills needed to take advantage. Our mission is to facilitate collaboration among organizations and initiatives working to bridge the digital divide in order to maximize the resources for the greatest impact. The steering council is Carrie Coogan, uh, the Kansas City Public Library. Can you wave, Carrie, or say hello? Good morning. Morning. Great to see everyone. <laughs> and is Aaron Deacon on? I am. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Tom Esselman. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. And I will be your moderator for today. I am Ina Montgomery of Urban Tech. And so we would, would like to know, are you currently a member? And if not, membership is free. And if you could just go to digitalinclusionkc.org to join. So it's real uh, simple, easy. And we meet every first Friday of the month at 1030. And you can also connect with us uh, through social media and all the uh, opportunities here. And this information is up on the website as well. So you'll have an opportunity to um, connect with us between meeting times. And so the agenda for today, we've got the welcome and new member introductions. I'll be doing a spotlight on Black History, uh, to, uh, in observance rather of Black History Month. We've got William Wells coming on with the Digital KC Now initiative uh, to give us a presentation on that. Device lending at the Kansas City Public Library by April Roy, and then internet connectivity and digital equity, equity report by Casey Rising and Mark. And then we've got some announcements at the end uh, to keep you current and updated. So first we're gonna kick off with the welcome and new member introductions. Are there any uh, people on for the first time? And if so, could you please introduce yourself by giving your name and your organization? Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Josh Miller and I'm with Verizon. Okay, and can I add uh, your role so you're your name, your organization, and your role within that organization. Of course, and I'm the manager of community engagement for Colorado, Kansas, and Kansas City. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, I'm Andrea Kyer, and I'm with Comcast in Government Affairs in the uh, Minnesota, Kansas, Wisconsin region. Morning. Good morning, my name is Michelle. I'm with the digital inclusion um, team, part of VISTA out of Kansas City Library. Morning, Michelle. Good morning, I'm Sarah Neely. I'm Josh's colleague. I cover government affairs on behalf of Verizon for the states of Colorado and Kansas, uh, including the Missouri yeah. side of the KC market, and I manage our municipal lobbying. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Any other new members or first time uh, checking us out, people? Okay, and I do want to mention I'm rocking my uh, red glasses here in recognition of uh, Wear Red Day, what? in case you weren't aware. <laughs> so the only thing I could, well, I already had the outfit planned, so I had to go with the outfit, then I remembered I had the red glasses, so here we are. All right, we got people steady coming in. Good to see a lot of people joining us. I guess I'll wait. Is there anybody who just came on who is new to the uh, Friday meeting? And if so, would you please introduce yourself 
by giving your name, your organization, and your role within that organization? Okay, I guess we're all here. So got people coming in. So I'm going to go ahead with my presentation. All right, so we are observing Black History Month, as you guys know, and uh, it shows that it runs from February 1 through March 1st, uh, 2022. And so what I wanted to do was give an introduction uh, for those who may not know, uh, but Black History Month honors the contributions and sacrifices of American African-Americans who have helped shape the nation. It celebrates the rich cultural, heritage, triumphs, and adversities that are a uh, indelible part of our country's history. Black History Month was actually uh, started by the father of Black history, Carter G. Woodson in 1926. He actually envisioned a week long celebration to encourage the coordinated teaching of Black history in public schools. And so the irony of that um, is that today Black history in most schools is not taught. It's probably a chapter or a paragraph uh, and as some have noted, it um, starts in the 60s and not in the 1800s when the actual history of Black Americans in America actually started. So he designated the second week of February as Negro History Week. And so you might ask, well, why the second week? Why February? Uh, February was chosen because the second week of the month coincides with the birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Lincoln, as we know, was influential in the emancipation of slaves, and Douglass, a former slave, was a prominent leader in the abolitionist movement, which fought to end slavery. So as a uh, recognition to both Lincoln and Douglass, Carter G. Woodson thought that the second week in, fe in February would be a good time to celebrate Black history. Then in 1976, under President Gerald Ford, uh, Negro History Week then became Black History Month. And so if you notice there in that picture uh, to the far right, you've got Jesse Jackson there rocking his uh, Afro um, way back in the day. And so, Carter G. Woodson started an organization called the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. And this was to recognize the dearth of information and the accomplishments of Blacks in 1915. Um, and so he founded this organization that still exists today. The organization designates a new theme each year for Black History Month in keeping with Woodson's established Negro History Week. This year's theme is Black Health and Wellness. This pays homage to medical scholars and healthcare providers. This theme is especially timely as we enter the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disproportionately affected minority, minority communities and placed unique burdens on Black healthcare professionals. So what I'm gonna to do today is to present to you, uh, I found a good timeline uh, that the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology put together. And this is a good presentation of black scientists. So I thought in sticking with the theme, uh, it would be a good way to introduce uh, you all to some contributions of Blacks. I'm not going to cover the whole timeline. I'll just mention because it's pretty, um, they did a good job of putting this together. But just starting in 1864, Rebecca Crumpler became the first Black woman to graduate from medical school. She practiced medicine with the focus on women and children, despite the, uh, facing intense racism and sexism. She also worked with the Freedmen's Bureau and provided medical care to freed slaves. 
uh, and I have the link, and, and I think this presentation will probably be up on the uh, digital inclusion website, so you can go back later and look at uh, all the uh, people. And so from 1920 to 1937, uh, we've got uh, Hildreth Augustus Poindexter in 1932. He becomes the first black person to earn both an MD and PhD uh, at Harvard University. His expertise in tropical diseases led him to the public health service. Then on this date range, 1941 to 1972, of course, we're familiar already with the women, the hidden figures, women, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson. Uh, but we also had at the end here in 1972, Roland B. Scott, who sometimes is called the father of sickle cell research and founded the Howard University Center for Sickle Cell Disease. This time range, 1974 to 1991, we've got um, Kenneth Olden. He was a cell biologist and biochemist. He becomes the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. He was the first black person to head an institute of the National Institutes of Health. 1992 to 2004, uh, we've got Keith L. Black in 1994. He patents a therapy for treating brain tumors using a synthetic version of the peptide bradykinin, which allowed targeting of brain tumors without affecting healthy tissues. And then finally from 2000, uh, 2010 to 2019, uh, let me see, i showcase Paula Johnson. She was a cardiologist and an advocate for women's health. She serves as the 14th president of Wesley College and the first black woman to serve in this row. And so uh, I like this quote here at the bottom. It talks about a diverse workforce is critical to ensuring that the US remains at the forefront of the disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, so again, this information, I thought, again, they did a good job. This is on the ASBMB website. And we'll make sure that that uh, link and this presentation is available on the digital inclusion um, website. I'm gonna switch back to our agenda. And up next, we have William Wells of Esteem Village. He's going to give us a presentation on Digital KC Now. Uh, thank you, Ina. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've got uh, my team here, um, so I'll just go ahead and can I share my screen? Yes, I know. Should there we go? Now you should be able to. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, I will just dive right in and close that window. <laughs> All right, there we go. So again, I'm delighted to be here today. And mayor and city for selecting us. We'll try to do you a good job. Digital KC Now is an initiative that we're deploying in the third district to basically digitally transform the community. I am proud of somebody who's from this community to have a steam village here. I'm proud of the folks that have clear paths for me and we're helping clear paths for so many into the future. Being left out of uh, the, the, the digital inclusion um, is so harmful for the benefit of moving things forward. And as, a, as the third district representative, my theory of change for this area is very simple. Economic 
development for our spaces and economic mobility for our people. This is something that people talk about everywhere, that we need to add internet access to all parts of every city. But we're doing it here. And there's a reason for that. There's a community that's invested in this, that's passionate about it. We've got political leadership that's committed to this sort of thing. And we've got people that can do the work. Um, I'm a parent of kids in K through 12, and I work closely with students. So I am glad again that you all are here to support us. And thank you. And you will see our works coming. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. My name is William Wells. I'm the executive director of Esteem Village. We're joined by a lot of our team, um, VISTAs, board members, um, parents, volunteers, and community members. That's the last time you're going to hear me say anything about Esteem Village because truly this project um, is just to kind of touch and, and help with the great work that this coalition is doing. So I'd like to extend a thank you to Aaron Deacon um, Ina Montgomery, Kerry Coogan, um, Tom Esselman, and the uh, Rick Usher on the steering committee for giving us an opportunity to share um, our, our initiative that's focused on the third district that we're hoping will be able to be replicated, not only in other districts, uh, but also in urban and rural communities across the country. Um, and it's, you know, our dynamic city is dynamic because we are made up of a bunch of dynamic communities. So I want to start with a, a glimpse back in the past, then I'm going to talk to you about what our project is. We're going to show a call to action of how we want community members and organizations that serve the community to get involved and, and, and it's going to take all hands on deck. We've been working with um, we've been working with incumbent service providers. We will continue to work with incumbent service providers, but we also are looking at how can we um, create um, neighborhood associations, empower communities, empower neighborhood associations to kind of um, be able to create their own economies so that we can truly achieve uh, a smart city status. So with that, I'll move to the next slide and and take a take a look back. We need jobs here in Portland, and that's why we need broadband, because it is broadband, wired and wireless, and provides a foundation for creating jobs, finding jobs, and doing jobs. Today, 62% of American workers depend on the internet to do their jobs. But in Portland, up to 60% of black men aged 18 to 34 don't have a job. And what we're beginning to understand is that in order to change that, we're going to need better access to broadband. Last year in North Portland, we had a job fair. 1,200 jobs were up for grabs. A lot of the folks in my district never heard about it. Why? Because you have to be online to find jobs, online to apply for jobs with an electronic resume. And if you don't have online, you are in trouble. And a lot of folks in Portland are in trouble. They don't have equity. They don't have easy access to broadband. They don't even know about it. That's why Portland has been developing a new strategic plan for broadband. And what's the number one goal? Generating new jobs for Portland. The Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics says jobs that involve using broadband internet will grow 25% by 2018. Two and a half times faster than other jobs which explains the second goal of Portland's broadband strategy, to eliminate the gaps in equity, access, and capacity. Today, our focus seems to be supplying broadband to businesses, early adopters, and startups, which is good, but not to the exclusion of other Portlanders. It's time to start focusing on all our communities, especially the 28% who need broadband but do not have it. We want abundant, affordable broadband in every neighborhood and every household. Because remember, Portland has more small businesses, many of them home-based businesses, than any other city in the U.S. It used to be waterways and roads were the critical infrastructure cities 
and economies needed to grow. Now it's computing and communications, broadband, fiber and wireless that drives economic development. We can't attract new businesses and jobs to Portland without abundant broadband for global connectivity. Plus, companies want educated, internet savvy, broadband empowered workers who know how to embrace change. So education is part of the job story too. And so is bandwidth to improve health care with services like online health records and real-time monitoring of patients. So is public safety and city sensor nets for sustainability, better transport. All of that requires better, faster, more ubiquitous broadband than we have now. And that's why we're asking you to take a look at Portland's broadband strategic plan. This is not just about jobs today. It's about assuring more jobs and better jobs tomorrow. It's about connecting to our future. Portland's broadband strategic plan. So you may be wondering, why are we showing um, Portland's um, plea for broadband all the way back in 2011? It's because the same um, problems that this coalition and everybody is approaching, it, it affects and it, it's, it's the same thing that's happening all over the country. So there are a lot of great playbooks out there. There are a lot of great ideas. There are a lot of things that have worked. There are a lot of things that haven't worked, but at the end of the day, that was pre-pandemic. Now we are post-pandemic. Pandemic as it, or we're not post-pandemic yet, but we're in a pandemic trying to get out of the pandemic and the pandemic has accelerated the need for us to give broadband internet access, adoption and utilization, but also to have the economic, the educational support needed to leverage the internet and its resources to empower neighborhoods while building a community of knowledge workers. It's an essential community infrastructure. We all agree on that. Our project emphasizes ensuring that access, premium access is present everywhere, especially in the areas that it doesn't exist today. We're thankful that the city of Kansas City supported the initiative um, to provide this access, work with everybody that is in the, the spirit, trying to say we need to connect everybody, especially with a focus and an emphasis on underserved communities. But just getting the connectivity to the homes, into the neighborhoods is not enough. We also have to rewire and repurpose those homes so that they can have physical wired broadband connectivity. Simply wireless inside the home is not gonna be the same because everything's moving to the cloud. Um, there's gonna be a lot of computation. So if we're thinking five to 10 years down the road, we're gonna need to look at the infrastructure, not only across the country, I mean, across our district, but we're also gonna have to look at the infrastructure inside of all of the old buildings that we have. And that pre presents the opportunity for us to create jobs for these young people. And while we create jobs, they can actually learn what is uh, what it takes to be a 21st century knowledge worker and to build this uh, infrastructure. So uh, connecting businesses and residents to the internet and underserved communities is a fundamental step, but it's only the first step. Access to and, and successfully doing this does impact and it affects our personal, personal, our social and economic development of communities. Knowledge is incremental in embracing diversity, equity, inclusion. The economy is a knowledge and information-based economy, which means that we not only have to have bright minds and utilize the bright minds um, to do the computational thinking that's needed to drive a, a knowledge and information-based economy, but it's also gonna support healthy community growth and development. Our project is, we have some key indicators that are short-term and long-term. Um, but it all ties down to a fourth stool. Everybody talks about the third stool, access, devices, and um, speed. But we think there's a fourth stool. And for us, that's the most important stool, and that's economics. Um, how can we raise median household income? How can we expand? Who gets to participate in the local, state, national, and global uh, digital economy? Information is the key. 
So we are, our program is designed to hire, train, and mentor a workforce from the community to drive the community, lead the community broadband network, um, and create knowledge workers. And again, the pilot focus is just in the third district. All right, so the ability we all know is access to education, career opportunities, remote work, public health information, up-to-date news, community being able to broadcast their own news, community being able to tell their own stories and not be dependent on external forces to tell their story for them. Um, increase in household income, increase in graduation rates, employment opportunities, financial stability. Um, the modern economy relies heavily on digital skills this the core of this project is to make sure that they have those digital skills and a pathway to enter into the digital economy knowledge societies will positively impact the health and wellness of people our focus on utilization of uh, and adoption of the internet by the community members is important to bridge the digital divide so in order to do that we have to be honest and look at what is there because like i said there's the AT&T's, the Google Fibers, the um, Spectrums and the other providers, there are resources that are available that probably just need to be leveraged. This is our data center on the left, but we, and before we built that, before we put our plan together, we did a, an assessment of technology, how it has developed, and we have settled on the need for a community network a smart city would be made up of smart communities. A smart community needs to run its own smart network. And we're grateful again for the city for giving us an opportunity to show this. So I, this video was one that I really liked. It just kind of talks about what the different technologies are and what is the need to be able to make sure that we can get premium access into areas that they, that they are not, that's not existing today and being able to do so in a way, not based on making money, but based on putting the community in a position to pull itself up and increase the median household incomes, increase the environment, increase the community. Until now, last mile network capacity has been the big bottleneck for delivering premium digital services. DSL and cable modem systems, today's most common last mile solutions, certainly represent a major advance over 56K dial-up modem technology, but both have significant limitations. Cable modems use a non-switched architecture designed for simultaneous broadcasting to everyone on the network. So, information sent by a user competes with everything else on the entire network, even if it's just going across the street. With so much information being sent network-wide, traffic backs up, security is compromised, access is limited, and speed is reduced dramatically. From an advertised maximum speed of 10 megabits per second to only one megabit per second or less. DSL uses existing analog copper phone systems, a technology never designed for broadband digital traffic. DSL capacity degrades significantly with distance. Its maximum speed of 7 megabits per second is only available to subscribers within approximately 3,000 feet of the central office. Beyond that, most customers get less than 1 megabit per second service, and 30% of homes and businesses are geographically unable to get DSL service at all. Both cable modem and DSL networks are asymmetric, meaning they cannot fully support applications requiring equal downstream and upstream speeds. So, these systems simply can't deliver bandwidth-intensive two-way services like virtual private networking and video conferencing. DSDN switches and switched network architecture provide intelligent, efficient bandwidth and traffic management. To prevent congestion, DSDN technology routes data packets intelligently within the network. When a user sends information, the DSDN network selects the shortest, most efficient path and routes the packet to its destination. This destination-specific routing also enhances network security. If one area of the network is experiencing high traffic, packets may be rerouted through areas of less traffic using redundant links between the nodes.
Even if a cable is cut, DSDN's multi-path routing capabilities easily detour around the affected area to deliver continuous service. Unlike cable modem systems, which transmit every communication network-wide, DSDN routes internal network traffic directly from its origin to its destination, making DSDN the most efficient peer-to-peer -peer solution available. So, that just kind of shows what, a, what our method of delivering a community broadband um, community-led, community-driven broadband network will look like. It is going to leverage, uh, leverage the resources that are already there. It's going to call partnerships with people that and organizations that are needed in order to be able to truly close the divide. And then we're going to work with our young people. We have 20 young people called the Red Tails that are actually learning um, how to pull cable, how to terminate cable, how to they're learning cybersecurity. They're learning all of the key skills that are needed, and we're wanting to scale, scale this um, um, in the third district and bringing um, young people into the economy and also retooling um, adults because it's going to take all hands on deck. Um, the, school, the skills that they're learning are transferable in the digital economies of today. A knowledge population has greater earning capabilities, financial stability, and public health outcomes. And that is what the outcome that we're ultimately looking for is creating better, more prosperous, shared prosperity, um, shared prosperity throughout the, the community. So move on to the next. Using technically trained citizens of the third district means the community will lead the charge. The community will lead the charge of education, healthcare, and workforce development for participation in the 21st century economy. All we're doing is working with a number of local and national partners and the city to bring this program to fruition. Access to education, professional opportunities, and health resources are key to fighting systemic poverty and equality. So you're saying, what is a community-driven broadband process? Access infrastructure, I mean, assess the infrastructure options, fund the broadband projects, engage the community, realize the benefits, and empower the community, which will ultimately digitally transform lives. Our playbook, which we will make available to you if you reach out to the VISTAs, they're probably putting their contact information in. The window is simple. We have a wheel that has four parts. Engage the community, assess the infrastructure options, fund the broadband um, projects, realize benefits and true use. Assessing the infrastructure options is the first thing we did. Work with an incumbent provider. We have been working with incumbent providers. Um, in order, one of the buildings that we're bringing on that's considered off net, we couldn't get them on net without working with the, with the incumbent provider. So I think that, um, that our approach is actually showing what collaboration really looks like. Request for information process. We've been working with UMKC and their students and their students have been gathering and engaging the community and they will continue to um, engage the community and, and collect information so that we can guide, I mean, to guide us to say, okay, this is working, this is not working. Uh, we didn't consider this because everything is evolving and, and, and changing rapidly. The next thing is fund the broadband project. Yes, the city has contracted with us and given us seed capital, not nearly as much as what we'll need to really do what we need to do, but that's why we're um, also engaging and working with private and other public funding opportunities. We've chosen a financial model. Um, we are um, also recognized by the ABB. So, um, I mean, the EBB, which is now the affordable, affordable plan. Um, so we will want you to, um, we want to basically have the neighborhoods and the communities to be able to um, get into those wheels of financing as well. Engaging the community, this is the big part, forming a broadband working group, identifying community priorities, stakeholder communication, convene for regional and policy context. Um, some of you may have noticed that we did this last year with our Red Tails UMKC in the third district. 
on our virtual community action planning. That was actually just planting the seed for this process that we're doing now. And we're gonna go through that same process and we're utilizing the preamble that um, UMKC Professor Lupino and the UMKC's Broadband Steering Committee put together as our compass to make sure that everybody's at the table during the planning, during the design, during the build and during the sustainability. We do this right, realizing the benefits, expanding access to education and health care, advanced ability to telecommute, discover business efficiencies, improve digital literacy and use. And all of these wills, they're not one, two, three, they're gonna be running and we'll be utilizing and be working simultaneously. And so I like to call it the will that's moving us down the road towards um, shared prosperity and shared access. Smart cities are driven by- Welcome to the world of limitless opportunity. Hundreds and thousands of data points collated and seamlessly shared at lightning speed to a central cloud, feeding the creation of sophisticated on-demand simulations, highly detailed synthetic worlds, accurate virtual models, a perfect digital twin of anything you can imagine. The Internet of Simulation is your passport to a world of possibilities. A smart testing and analysis platform with the power to predict behavior and deliver in-depth, actionable, intelligent insights. Do you want to make your city smarter? The data collation and analysis capabilities of the Internet of Simulation offer untold opportunities. In a warehouse, simulations forecast the best route through the system, exploring thousands of possible scenarios. Compared against live data queues from cars, buildings and people, creating a logistical, virtual roadmap, predicting outcomes, enabling smart decisions, identifying the most efficient, cost-effective path from warehouse to delivery point. Do you need a deeper, on-demand view of your data? As systems get more connected, the Internet of Simulation enables faster modeling of the whole network, from device to cloud, creating a chain reaction of processes, drawing power from miles away, exploring all these simultaneous events that can be tracked and analyzed in a virtual world of complex data, pulled together into place for a clearer, bigger picture. Do you want to improve manufacturing processes or accurately calculate premiums? A car is manufactured from thousands of parts, shipped in from worldwide suppliers, each part with a history and behavior. In a simulation shared over the cloud, which are brought together using co-simulation to create a digital twin that's augmented with driver behavior and car performance, where everything is recorded, analyzed, and predicted, allowing the premium to be adjusted as things change. Can you begin to imagine the potential of these groundbreaking digital twins? What opportunities and safeguards could this unlock for your business? Are you ready to unlock the power of the Internet of Simulation? So that is a glimpse at um, the why. Here's our contact information. Um, Casey Digital Inclusion Coalition Steering Committee, I hope I did you proud and um, I hope I was under our 20 minutes. I know you wanted some time for Q&A, so I will stop sharing my screen and um, our team members will come off mute and we'll field questions or we can um, just say thank you for having us. Thank you, William, for that presentation. I think that was um, very informative, so I know I know more about it. Does anybody, do we want to entertain questions now or wait until the end? We want to probably do it while it's fresh in everybody's head. Yeah, go ahead, DJ. Are you working with Guadalupe centers? Yes, we actually teach a class of Guadalupe Center students. Um, actually, one of the students that you may have saw in the background pulling cable and terminating cable is a Guadalupe Center student that's in my class during the day. 
and he works with our Red Tails group on um, Friday nights and Saturdays. So I'll just tell you that we're working on a project with Guadalupe Centers that um, I just texted their CEO. So we probably should talk offline at some point. So Okay, sounds good. Definitely looking forward to working with you. Anybody else has a question or comment for William? It looks well, like raised, Leslie has her hand up. I was going to say, I raised my hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> um, so I have a couple questions, William. Um, first of all, um, you know, the focus on community is awesome. And I'm wondering, you know, given that this isn't necessarily an unserved area that you're working in, um, it's just a lower connected area, what difference do you think having this um, network that you're putting in, you know, how does that help? move the needle on adoption? And then also, what aha moments have you been noticing from your kids? Amy and Andy, you guys want to take that one? Sure. Uh, I guess I could take a stab at in terms of the, uh, the first part of the question. Um, just to clarify, the, the, your first question was, what do we see as the, the benefits? I just want to make sure I understood the question. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, there is service available where you're putting this in, but there's obviously a reason that you're doing it because there's, you know, it's viewed differently from the community. So I was just wondering if you could talk more about that. Well, I, I think you have to, one, be clear about um, the fact that it is available because everyone in the community, one, does not have access. They may have uh, a different form of access, maybe their phone or, or something of that nature. You have some individuals who may not have it at all, right? So there's varying forms, but also in terms of the adoption, I think what's important to, to understand is that, like, in terms of like how different people view the need and necessity for internet access and, and content very differently. And so what you think applies to one community that might not necessarily apply to people in the third district. And so uh, the beauty is that we're a little bit closer to the scene and, and we're working hard to better understand what are some of those barriers to adoption? What are perceptions? What's the actual usage, you know, the use case scenarios. And so we're trying to um, not only provide the access, but then and ensure that people can just adopt it, right, and, and run with it. Um, I think I think we're in a certain, in a sense, we're kind of changing uh, behaviors and, and notions about the uh, the advantages of uh, information. So, just to clarify, yeah. you're you're saying there are parts of the third district that are unserved by any incumbent ISP? No, no. Yes. So, what, what? I mean, let me, let me tell Go you. Ahead, Mr. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so Leslie, you know, you've been to our location. We're at 1600 Paseo Boulevard. Uh, Rick, you, you remember when you guys put out the community connections and I didn't apply, you asked us to apply. And then when we applied, they said, no, uh, you can't get the service. It's not available to you. Right. And so we ended up getting um, Spectrum, which we have right now. And um, as a backup, uh, we're getting paying 100 bucks a month for, uh, I think, 100 meg down to 25 meg up. But then the network, which is the core infrastructure that we're passing through the third district that's at our disc that are at our location is a full gig up four gig down and it can go up to 10 gig. Right. And so if you put our address in, in a lot of can you get broadband here, it says, no, we don't qualify. If you put um, the Kitty Depot on 21st and Prospect, can you get fiber there? It says, no. Well, we've got fiber at our location and we've gotten fiber at Kitty Depot. Kitty Depot is off site. And then we're utilizing other areas to be able to. Um, I mean, other partners and incumbents in, if included to be able to make sure we fill in the gaps. Got it.
I'm just curious about those aha moments from the kids. Yeah, we have plenty of videos. Um, Andy did an interview. I don't know if she's on the call or not. But um, yeah, they, they're like, they thought it was difficult. Um, I see Ricky is on the call. Uh, Ricky, you actually worked with the kids to pull the cable. Do you want to jump in? And you probably saw the aha, aha moments as it unfolded. You're muted. You're, you're muted, Ricky. You're muted. <laughs> Yes, it's very exciting to see the kids when they uh, are installing and learning new information, learning how to uh, uh, provide the internet service that we give to clients. And like William said before, a lot of the clients do have, have um, access to internet, but the internet is intermittent and they're so happy that we're coming around to do it for them. Um, and that's everywhere. So the kids are uh, amazing because every day they have these aha mo moments. So um, as he said, you can see on the videos that we have some, we have pictures, um, videos of them, and you'll see how excited they are to, it's, to be doing installations, uh, taking classes, learning, this, learning how to install. So for me, it, is very exciting. And I thank you, William, for giving us this opportunity to do that. Yes, sir. And, and Mr. Wells, just to add in terms of the aha moment, uh, I know Andy and I, when we are recruiting, actively recruiting uh, students to be a part of Ace Team Village, and all of them are by and large on their devices, right? And the first thing we ask them is about, hey, would you like to learn more about, you know, how to create the content? I, it, it's interesting because a lot of students are consumers of content, but have no um, connection to how they can be how they can be creators of that content, and, and how, as a creator, that could lead to employment opportunities, right, or, or things of that nature. And so there's there's an apparent disconnect. Yeah, Andy, you're muted. All right, did you have any fine, anybody else have a question or comment for William? Okay, and I believe a lot of contact information is in the chat room. Uh, so if you wanna check that out, you can contact them directly about the initiative. Any final comments, William, or you're good? No, I'm good. Just thank you for having us and uh, you do a great job. Thank you. Okay, next we have April Roy. She is the Director of Employee Success at the Kansas City Public Library. You ready to go, uh, April? I am. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started. I feel really um, great being with this group. I used to do a lot of work with this group when I was the manager of the LH Bluford Library. So I feel like I'm here among friends today. I'm going to be introducing a new technology lending program that the library is preparing to roll out. Um, I'll be brief and try to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, the library has received a sizable, I think you guys probably have heard from Carrie and Wendy, a sizable um, grant ECF technology lending, to fund an ECF technology lending program. And I'm just going to tell you guys about that. So um, the project is funded by the Emergency Connectivity Fund. We are hoping to deploy for circulation to the public 1,200 Chromebook computers and 300 more hotspots um, to be circulated at all of our library branches. Um, the Chromebooks will be internet ready with the T-Mobile SIM card. So they're just turn on and go um, to give people access to the um, connectivity that they need. And the project does have plenty of in-library support. We did get um, an ARPA grant, that's the American Rescue Plan Act grant to support two staff members to help us deploy this. Um, those are our mobile technology specialist, Enrico Mejia, and our mobile technology training specialist, Jason Bruin. Um, we're really working with all of our library departments on this, um, cataloging our branches, public affairs, 
everyone in the library system is really involved with um, helping get this project running. Um, it's all happened very quickly. The funding was given to us very quickly. So we're trying to work fast to get these out to the public. Um, our 300 new hotspots will deploy first. We are planning to package those um, actually next week, which is really exciting for us. We'll be packaging the hotspots, hopefully to have them in circulation at our library branches um, by March. So 300 new hotspots will go out to all of our library locations. Um, the hotspots do currently have a long holds list. Um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to fill all of the current holds and then offer some hotspots on the shelves for checkout in our library branches. Um, these are just like the hotspots that the library has been circulating. So um, they're really easy to use. We have some great documentation that we include on how to use those hotspots. And um, the big exciting part is that we hope to roll out 1200 Chromebook computers to circulate um, to our library patrons in Kansas City. 300 of these Chromebook computers have been earmarked to circulate through our community partners. Um, that's where we see all of you playing a big role um, to help us come up with great ideas, ways to use these Chromebooks and get them into the hands of the people that really need them. Um, and again, all of our Chromebooks are internet ready with mobile SIM cards. There are a few things to keep in mind though. Um, our general circulation policy for both the hotspots and the Chromebooks will be a 21 day loan period um, with no renewals. That has to do with uh, connectivity um, getting turned off if the devices become overdue. Um, they'll be able to check them out. Almost all of our card types that we have verified. So all of our public library accounts that someone has verified their address with. Um, there will be some lost and damage fees, but we're also very flexible when things happen. And we're only going to circulate these devices to um, our patrons that are 13 and over. So patrons 12 and under will not be able to check out the devices. Um, that's our standard circulation policy moving forward. That's not to say, though, that the Kansas City Public Library is not flexible, particularly when we're working with our partners. Um, so if you identified a need that didn't necessarily fit into um, this circulation policy, we are able to be flexible. There are also a few things that we have to do in order to be compliant for our ECF funding. Um, this also can affect our E-rate funding if we're not compliant. So each device must be checked out to a patron individually with a library card. That means that we can't just check out 50 devices to an organization. We have to actually check them out to a person with a library card. Um, that's to help us verify that each patron only has one device checked out. Um, that's another stipulation of the ECF funding. And the patrons have to agree to an attestation statement at the time of checkout. Again, that's another component of us receiving the ECF funding and being compliant with ECF. So that'll make it a little trickier when we're working with partners, but we think it's definitely something that we can overcome. Um, this is our terms of service. This is basically our attestation statement that says that the people that are using the, the device um, do not have adequate um, connectivity services to meet their educational needs um, and that they only have one device checked out at a time. So each person that takes possession of one of the Chromebooks does have to say, yes, I'm checking this out because I don't have adequate connectivity. Uh, so three cheers for our library partners. Again, I'm keeping this pretty brief because it's all really new. Um, we love working with all of you and we really want to help you with any organizational needs that you might have. Um, like I mentioned before, our partners will be able to extend checkout periods um, for the terms of their program, things like that, um, by just working with us. If you let us know your needs, we'll definitely try to meet those needs. Uh, we also have staff, um, support staff available to help with checkout events, to help with getting people library cards, um, all of those things we can do. So if you have an event or something happening, a class starting, anything at all, 
that library staff can help come and bring the Chromebooks and help them get checked out properly with that attestation statement, um, we'll be happy to do that for your organization. Um, and like I mentioned before, this is all really new. We're all learning together and we haven't really had a chance to hear from our community partners what their great ideas might be. Um, so if you're, I'm hoping that now that you are hearing about this, maybe for the first time, um, the wheels in your brain are turning and you're thinking of all of these great ways that the library can partner with you um, to get these Chromebooks into the hands of the people that might need them the most. So no idea is too big or too small. Um, this is a brand new program for the library. We've never rolled anything like this out before um, to this scale. So we're really excited to hear what your needs are, um, what your questions are, and how we can work together to help you. And if you have questions, just ask. Um, here's my name and my contact information. Um, I'm happy to work with you. If you have a great idea for partnership, please just talk with uh, myself or Wendy or Carrie, and we'll be happy to start figuring out how we can make things work. So again, very brief overview. I was told I didn't have a ton of time, so I just wanted to kind of put the information out there and then answer any questions that you all might have. I see that Aaron's raised his hand with a question. I'm happy to answer those. How do you, what, what kind of content restrictions are on the devices? So the devices um, do per our ECF funding and library guidelines, they are um, filtered to meet the CIPA compliance that's the Child Internet Protection Act. So they'll have some of the same filters that the library computers have. Gotcha, thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, part of the thing that makes the checkout of these a little more complicated um, is that we need to make sure that people's information is safe, that the computers aren't, don't have any information stored on them or accounts saved that people could log into. Um, and we're also able to allow the patrons to do more if we take some extra steps at the checkout point and at the return point. So we're working through all of that right now to see what that process will be. All right, great. Anybody else comments or questions for April? And again, all the contact information will be sent out next week um, by the library. So you can follow up with her then. I have one question if I could ask on April. The, uh, so when you're, when you're putting these, checking these things out, how long are they checked out for? Like what, if somebody was trying to connect us with the project or something, how long could they have the Chromebooks? So the standard checkout period for the Chromebook will be um, 21 days for patrons. So if you come into the library and check the Chromebook out, you'll get to keep it for 21 days. That's standard for almost all of our library materials. Um, so we just wanted to kind of keep things even. If you needed it for some other reason, um, we do have a values-based customer service at the library, so we're always willing to work with people, and we're going to be particularly willing to work with folks that are participating in library programs, of course. So um, say, for example, we had um, an English as a second language class starting. We could check those out to that entire class for the duration of that class. Or say we had a community partner that had a program running, and that partner said, hey, I have these folks that need this connectivity but our program runs for six weeks instead of three weeks, we can definitely adjust that checkout time for those reasons. April, I've got one question. I think you said that the hotspots would be checked out. Uh, oh, the program for the hotspots would begin in March. Um, did you say when the Chromebook part of it will start, do you think? <laughs> I didn't, Mary Kay. Um, you definitely caught me on that one. We're having some <laughs> supply chain issues in getting the cases to circulate the Chromebooks. So we're just sort of waiting for those and finishing a final few details. Um, but it's hard to say exactly when we're gonna roll those Chromebooks out because we aren't exactly sure when we'll have all the things we need to be able to do that. Right. We have all the parts for the hotspots. <laughs> we just don't have all the parts for the Chromebooks quite yet. Oh, can I see Tamara's hand up? Mm -hmm. Hi, April. My question is, I thought I saw in your presentation that um, patrons could not recheck out the Chromebooks. Is that accurate? So a person would be able to check out a Chromebook for three weeks. And at the end of that three weeks, 
they can't check it out again? So the thing with that um, is that they would need to bring it back into a library and we can definitely get them another device or make sure that that device um, hasn't been turned off, the connectivity hasn't been turned off for any reason. Um, if there are no holds on a Chromebook, they would be able to take a Chromebook right back out. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna, uh, can you please stop sharing April so I can? Yeah. Oh. Just one moment. Thank you all so much. And again, if you have any other questions, please just be in touch. Okay, next we're gonna hear from uh, Rick Usher. I'm sorry, no, we're gonna hear from uh, Casey Rising and Mark, uh, Mike Heckman with Rock Creek Way and Marlene Nagel of Mark. Thank you. Um, I know I know we're running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna be super brief. Uh, it's good to see you all again. I've uh, talked a couple of times before with this group and um, to try to accelerate this session, I really just wanted to update the group on progress from the last time we all spoke, talk to you a little bit about some focus groups that uh, that have been done, and then give you a really high level summary of the set of, um, I'll, I'll call it framework recommendations that have come out come, come out of our work together. And um, just in advance, thank a lot of people on this call have been intimately involved uh, throughout the process. So my desire was to have a lot of your, your thoughts and inputs represented in this work. So um, I will go ahead and share my uh, screen real quick. And again, I will work really hard to be, um, to be brief. Can you all see my, uh, can you all see the PowerPoint deck? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, I've, I've talked to you guys bef um, uh, a few times before, so I don't want to spend, don't want to waste a ton of time uh, kind of resetting the stage. Um, I will uh, share this deck out with everybody so you can look in more detail, <clears throat> but, but effectively, this slide just talks about what we were up to um, the engagement that myself from Rock Creek Way had in conjunction with Casey Rising and Mark. Uh, Marlene Nagel's on the call as well and, and may jump in with some color commentary as I work through. Um, the key objective we had was, um, was to, to do a set of quantitative and qualitative uh, research and insight in support of this key objective of, of uh, a stance that everybody should be connected, which I know you guys all agree with. Uh, that's that's why you're part of this group. Um, the approach consists on the qualitative front. The approach consisted of a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, three targeted focus groups. Many of many folks on this call participated in one or more of those focus groups. And um, uh, I'll take just a moment to thank Leslie Scott. Um, 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 Mar Marlene Nagel and Carrie Coogan for helping me to co-facilitate those focus groups. I think all three of those people are on this call today. So just a, a thank you for, um, for, for helping me uh, uh, put on those focus groups. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then, and then we had a clear, clear um, need to support uh, the, the three-legged stool that William mentioned early on around advancing infrastructure access to devices and development of skills and know-how. Um, so um, let's see, what did we do? We, we looked at the data. Again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going quickly. I just, I'm, I'm conscientious of time. Uh, we looked at the data, we looked to obtain community input, um, we looked to connect the dots and we looked to provide a framework. And the last bullet point is probably the most important for me to communicate to this group. Um, our intent was to provide a framework, which means, it's it's an outline of a, a, a outline of recommendations and a way of looking at the world. It's not meant to be um, <clears throat> written in stone. It's it's meant to be iterated on in a starting point and in sort of an organizing framework by which um, by which uh, can contribute to community advancement around this topic. Um, and I say that because there may be pieces of of what you see where where you you all may have. Um, different thoughts and ideas and, and recommendations on how to improve on that framework. And that's exactly the point. So um, 
real quickly on uh, because this was an important part of our entry point is what does the data tell us? And Marlene and her team really drove the data analysis on this on this front. And, and I believe this has been shared with the group in a bit more detail in the past. But let me summarize what the um, at the highest level what the data showed. Um, broadband access doesn't equal subscriptions. So um, I think that that's already been discussed um, on, on this call today. Um, there is there there is currently disparity of access to broadband um, that exists within our community by race and geography. Um, there is disparity of adoption or subscriptions, um, not surprisingly, by income. And Kansas City as a metropolitan area ranks in the lower half of its peer cities on all three of those indicators. And I've listed the comparable cities here at the bottom of the slide. So that was sort of a starting point baseline of what the macro level data told us. Um, so with that and, and with all of your input um, and many others inputs, we came up with a series of three fundamental recommendations. Um, the first of those recommendations is to adopt measures. It's very difficult to manage what you don't measure. Um, and, and the way that the way that I've represented the measures in this slide are really down here at the bottom is the kind of the important focus. Um, a set of measures uh, that focus around infrastructure, um, a set of measures that focus around device access, and a set of measures that um, that that derive around skills and know-how. So clearly those line up to, to the three-legged stool. But interestingly, and I got some good feedback in, in some of the community conversations on this point, um, there's, there's sort of a macro view to a micro view of these measures, meaning infrastructure does a great job of representing sort of the macro view of our, of our city. And as you get down to the skills and know-hows of individuals, it gives us an opportunity to, to get that micro measurement of how the citizenry is doing. And so the primary point from a framework standpoint of this recommendation is to kind of cut across both the macro um, aggregated view of the world down to also the micro, what's the individual impact of activity within our community. So that's the first kind of fundamental framework recommendation. The second one, is related to how we um, how we sort of um, uh, compare where we where we want to spend our energies. And historically, it's it's um, you know it's, it's easy to kind of revolve around hey we want to improve digital equity and um, and and I think all of us on the call would agree with that. But sometimes you find an apples and oranges comparison. Are you you know are you um, you know, setting up new infrastructure like 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 William talked about, are you deploying a new device program like like the um, like Casey Library is doing? Um, those are those are both very important con contributors to improving digital equity, but it's difficult to have an apples to apples comparison. And so what we did was we thought about well, what are what are the piece parts that kind of can you can provide some uniformity on how to. Um, identify what is being impacted by any programming associated with um, digital equity. And what, what we did was it came up with these three categories you'll see down at the bottom. The first is very familiar. It's really just a direct restatement of the three-legged stool of infrastructure, hardware, and skill development. The second one, which we call meaningful use catalyzers, really represent, um, represent this um, a, an opportunity to create a spark. So regardless of what kind of infrastructure or access to devices that somebody has, if they're not used to utilizing technology, they're not used to utilizing the internet and everything that goes along with that, then some kind of catalyz catalyzing spark can be really impactful from a, from a program development standpoint. And, and we kind of thought there's really three categories. There's things that have to do with employment. If I'm, I'm looking for a job, I'm performing a job, I'm maybe getting promoted in a job. Um, there are items related to education, all the way from primary education to secondary education to the promotion of whatever um, uh, whatever um, um, uh, cr credentials that folks in the community may be working on, um, and then and then healthcare interaction, um, which clearly became a, a visible uh, spark during uh, during the pandemic, where folks access to healthcare at least for a period of time was limited. In, in a lot of ways to, to, uh, to, to technology and a, a video interaction with a provider. So those, those are on this list because they be, can become a spark for action and, and, and a real reason to engage with technology. 
And then the third category, which came really almost completely out of our focus groups, was this concept that, that I mold around with the terminology, but landed on resilience factors. So these are factors that create an ongoing reason to be engaged with technology. Um, and the, the, three, the three items we mentioned here were, were family and faith. I uh, heard a lot about, um, especially during the pandemic, uh, opportunity to use, utilize technology to engage with my family or to engage with my church um, became, became, became an important kind of ongoing reason to, to stay engaged with technology. Um, community involvement, which also could include access to uh, programming and um, um, uh, other um, other benefits that may be involved with, within the community, but that require um, a computer, the internet to access those things uh, would fall into this category. And then job creation. And I'm differentiating job creation from employment because we're really talking about uh, uh, anything that's going to help create a new job or promote a spirit of entrepreneurship um, and create kind of that ongoing sustainable resiliency as part of the programming. So Bottom line here is um, these are nine factors that we think are important when you're evaluating uh, what kind of impact a, a digital equity related program can have. Um, my encouragement or our encouragement is to consider all nine of these factors. And the more of them you're impacting, um, likely the, the, more, the, the more value is being injected into the community as it relates to this topic. Sorry, that was a, a, a long time and I know I'm speaking fast. So again, I apologize for that. And then the third and final um, kind of framework recommendation, really what hits, the, I think is, is um, completely aligned with, with this group here today, and that is to formalize regional collaboration. Um, and this group represents a, you know, the, a, a really strong, important component of regional collaboration. But the one key difference that I have on this slide is um, a su support for funding of resources. I mean, this is a fully volunteer group here today. Um, and, and I think, you know, what, one thing that could be really useful in advancing the ball from a regional collaboration standpoint is, is, is having a, a funded resource or set of resources that are, uh, that it's their job to think about organizing us as a community every day around this topic. And then um, I know there are a lot of words on this slide and I really don't want to, uh, I don't want to take the time uh, or, or burn our time to go through each word, but I will point out two uh, I think important factors uh, that, that are represented here. One is really, um, I'll call it a board that, um, that is inclusive, um, much, much like this group of, uh, of a number of, of perspectives that I think really promote collaboration through the community. Um, the other is a community advisory group, which is meant to represent the people that are actually doing the work, the individuals or um, agencies or um, people with great ideas that, that, are, that are out there and, and ready to contribute to um, uh, at the individual project level, if you will, of, of advancing, advancing digital, uh, digital connectivity across the region. I think both of those together, both of those groups, and, and you can, we can define those groups a million different ways, inclusive of what exists today. Um, this is just one, one articulation of that. Those entities working together to share information, to um, uh, help, help, uh, help help each other understand how best to communicate to um, to the general community, uh, to help understand where potential funding access points might be, um, all promote, um, and, and in our opinion, promote uh, and continue to pro promote uh, an element of regional collaboration. So. I went really fast. I apologize for going so fast, but we're, I know we're time constrained, and uh, and that's it. And I, I actually shared these these kind of high level recommendations with the Kansas City Civic Council a couple of weeks ago as well. And, and I thought it would be great great set of information to close the loop uh, with with this group uh, com, uh, as, as it compares to to our last dialogue. So I'll pause there. And as I said, be glad to share uh, to share this out to everyone. All right, thank you, uh, Mike. If you could stop sharing so I could look real quick to see who is up next with the, the lead. It is, uh, yeah, Rick Usher of the Usher Garage. Yeah, thanks, Ina. And uh, 
Thanks, Mike, on your presentation. Um, I, I'm uh, here to talk about the uh, emergency broadband benefit, which now since uh, the first of the year has been, is the uh, affordable connectivity program. Um, we're, we're working on an effort to develop a, a marketing campaign, a public outreach campaign for this. And William, it's great to hear that uh, your, your program is now uh, recognized in that uh, benefit. The, um, the, the challenge that we have that I've, I've talked about in this group in the past is that the, the benefit's been available really since May of last year. And we haven't had a really organized effort to get the word out to the public, especially the public that qualify for this benefit. Um, and, uh, and really what's happening then is, is we're, we're missing out on really significant federal funding. I just did a rough calculation from uh, the My Sidewalk report to the five county region. And, and this, um, this is gonna be low because the, uh, the, the affordable connectivity program now is available to households making less than 200% of the federal poverty level. Uh, the My Sidewalk numbers, I think might even be uh, lower income than that. But what, what I'm getting is that with, with one year of that benefit being paid to close the digital divide, if we were able to focus that to households that we, we know from these reports aren't connected, that's $26 million annually coming to the region through this um, affordable connectivity program. So there is, there is significant reason for local governments, counties, and other organizations to get behind supporting uh, a public outreach campaign. The other problem is that in the infrastructure bill, BEAD and some other of the, the programs funded in the infrastructure bill, funding for public outreach programs won't be available until 2023. Uh, we, where there was a call with TJ Roberts at the state, the new uh, broadband director at the state of Missouri, um, outlining this. So there's really a disconnect between getting the word out to the public in a really organized way and, um, and then the funding to be able to do that. So um, just to, to, and to keep this brief, uh, uh, William Crumpler has... Uh, expanded on uh, some of the work that I was doing. I was just taking some look at some numbers by zip code, but uh, William, if you'd like to share uh, the mapping you've done, um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing really to show where the um, benefit, where households that are eligible for the benefit are in the region. And uh, William, if you wanna go ahead and describe what you've got here, that'd be great. Yes, so this is just the beginning of trying to crunch a little bit of data around this problem, uh, but there are three maps here uh, just to very quickly kind of let you know what we've started to do. So based off of data taken from the Census Bureau, uh, we've been able to map out by zip code where are the largest populations uh, of eligible households in the Kansas City region. So those zip codes that are colored the most deeply yellow are those with the largest number of households that are under 200% of the federal poverty limit, which is the threshold for the ACP right now. Uh, and then <clears throat> based off of uh, numbers released by USAC as of the first of this year for signups for the emergency broadband benefit program, which is what it was, as Rick said before, it was uh, the ACP. Uh, we can see uh, here a heat map that shows the percentage of the eligible population that have signed up. So you can see that there are a few zip codes right in the heart of Casey Mo where there's actually pretty high sign up rates, uh, but it's pretty low outside of that. So there's definitely a lot of progress to be made. And then based off of that, we can create a little bit of a map showing exactly what zip codes to prioritize for outreach. So the zip codes here that are colored the most deeply blue are those that have the largest number of households which are eligible, but not signed up. So by targeting uh, the zips and the communities uh, where there is the greatest need, uh, we think that this will be a, uh, an efficient way to really make an impact and get people signed up for the program and uh, get them receiving these benefits. And yeah, then and I'd, I'd, I'd like to sorry, point out, if you could go back to that second slide. 
this is this is a really positive piece of this work because as we know looking at zip codes most impacted by poverty and lack of home internet connectivity the, these zip codes in red they're also in, in kansas city missouri the health department identifies these as life x zip codes so zip codes most impacted by systemic racism by lack of health care, lack of, you know, every kind of desert that's described, food desert, health care desert. I've noticed entrepreneur support deserts. Um, so what's what's happening, though, is that households in these zip codes are somehow becoming aware of this. I think the wireless companies have done a lot to push uh, the benefit, um, but but more needs to be done really to help reach out to these organizations now and you can also see some of the differences between uh wyandotte county and so go to that the next slide on the eligible households uh not signed up this dark blue over in wyandotte county that's northeastern wyandotte county and um i know that that the the county government had put a notice of this program in their latest newsletter. Leslie Scott shared that with me, but just more needs to be done. And uh, uh, Rachel uh, Olhausen has asked me about uh, organizations, you know, in, in the chat here, other organizations. Really, I think the, the thing that's going to need to happen is that trusted community partners, which, uh, like as William has pointed out, his organization is is quickly becoming a trusted community partner to fill some gaps, big gaps on connectivity, need to be doing this outreach to, to make residents more aware of, of what's available to them. Because it's gonna take really a broad array of solutions to, uh, to close the divide, whether it's gonna be wireless devices or whether it's gonna be home internet connectivity. I mean, I think for speed concerns, the, uh, a wired connection at home is the way to go, but people need to be really cautious about which provider they go with because AT&T, Spectrum, um, others provide much different speeds in these zip codes. Can I, can I mention something about that, um, Rick? And I can only speak from our experience with yeah. Jewish Family Services, um, but hey, everyone. So we land in a zip code that looked like it had pretty high EBB usage, which I'm proud of. Um, like, I think we helped contribute to that. Some of our challenges as a community-based organization have been that our social workers and the folks who are working with those individuals, they're not EBB experts. And also it was a tedious process for all of 2021. We had um, Marianne Atterbury, who was doing our Tech Connect program. She spent I would say depending on like two to four hours with some of our older adults to get signed up through this process. So it's not an untedious thing to do. And it is a burden on the community-based organizations. So I just encourage folks who are maybe working in these zip codes to really try to think about how we as CBOs articulate the needs for this group. Um, and just would advocate too that for the folks who are on more of the digital side and the broadband side that we support the social workers and the care managers, case managers who are doing that to help shuttle the applicants through that process. Because it's just incredibly tedious and we can give them the information, but that adoption rate is challenging. Even for the older adults, if, they, if we didn't hold their hands the whole way, this was something that they were used to living without. And it just seemed like too big of a of a hoop to jump through and they would have continued to live without internet. I'm still curious about what the like stickingness level of their adoption will be now that our program is done. Um, which is why I asked like how many sparks <laughs> does it take to get yeah. someone to adopt something that they're not used to. Um, and I think the same could be said of, of all ages, um, especially even like middle age, like 40s, 50s, 60s, which is a young older adult, like what does that mean if you've never used it? So just some thoughts there, but it's it has been a challenge. And I I think partnership is key, but it's not a silver bullet just to get them the information. Um, Rachel, this is Marlene Nagel. And I had a question, you know, I know that some of the Medicare uh, Advantage plans offer um, 
uh, free uh, memberships to gyms for physical activity. I wondered if there's an opportunity, whether it's working through Medicare or maybe some private insurance um, to see the benefit of telehealth and pay, helping to pay for connections and the services you just mentioned. Yeah, and I think at Mark, you've got a great resource with Dr. James Stowe and the Managed mm -hmm. Service Network. Like that's how we at JFS have been connected to Blue KC and SpiraCare and also working with the Kansas City Health Collaborative um, just to be all at the same table. And mm -hmm. I think we all know this here, but when we think of social determinants of health, digital inclusion is a really big umbrella of a social determinant of health that impacts how you can get transportation to in employment, all of it. So yeah, I think we should ask for help with those folks. And, you know, yeah. Leslie, I'll reach out about if we can get into a spire care clinic for you, um, because it's the it's the next step. Like our healthcare employees are super taxed, right? I don't know that they're gonna be able to help do the EBB sign up, but it's just nice for people to have a place to call for help with that application and help analyzing all of the choices they have to make, like speed. Some of them don't even know what, what speed they need for what activities. Kind of related to that, Rachel, is that a number of the FQHCs and others have, have helped their patients sign up for the health, the federal health insurance marketplace. And I just wonder if, you know, those navigators could be a helpful resource. I mean, dollars would need to be available to help them, but that might be also another way to help people get signed up. William, thank you for sharing these maps. They're really helpful. Or did Let's anybody? Know. I was just going to say, hopefully we'll have uh, more, more to share in the future as well. Okay. Uh, can you stop sharing, William? Thank you for those maps. I uh, know that Rick wanted that as a backdrop for his content. Uh, any last comments, Rick? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, and I think we are, we're already over on time. And we had a net inclusion conference announcement uh, for February 14th. And then the state of state, Missouri and Kansas broadband planning. Did anybody wanna speak on those two things uh, like real quick? I can speak very briefly on the net inclusion conference. I reached out to the folks at NDIA to see if I could get any details about how we can connect virtually. Um, it is going to be an option. There's no registration required and there will be no cost involved. Um, you can tune in for free. They have not quite set up the platform for live streaming yet but encourage you to check back onto the website, which I will drop into the chat and include in the um, follow-up newsletter next week as kind of a reminder too. But basically the day the conference starts, which is on Tuesday, just check the website and you should be able to click which uh, sessions you wanna join and, and basically watch live stream. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. And that last item, did anybody wanna speak on? State. Uh, I think we had that as a placeholder. <clears throat> if uh, if BJ uh, or Stan were able to join us uh, and actually okay. put it on um, re really early, there wasn't a ton of detail in the state plans. There's a little bit more, but we're continuing to work with them. And I think uh, at at such time as there's more detail, we'll look forward to having them give a more in depth presentation at a future coalition meeting. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. All right, we're at 12.05. Thank you, everybody, for your time and uh, staying over time. As Wendy said, all the information will be up on the website next week. Uh, a, a copy of this recording of the meeting today as well. And I appreciate your time and everybody have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, Diana. Uh-huh. Have a great day. Thank you you too. Right.